Frontier Impact Group do. We develop and finance projects that result in, in, in improved environmental and social outcomes. And obviously, renewable energy is a key focus of our business. Mel and I together have around 60 years experience in developing and financing energy projects, everything from wind, solar, hydro and bioenergy projects. On the Frontier Impact Group website, um, you'll see that you can get online access to the guidebook for those that don't have um, the guidebook at this point in time. And you can also request the financial template. Now, once you're on our database, um, as we get more updates of the financial template, we, we send that out to you um, uh, when those updates occur, which, which won't be too regularly, um, but, they, but they will happen in the future as we develop more templates for new types of renewable energy projects. Now, the Behind the Metre Solar Guidebook is only one component of the ARENA Community Energy Toolkit that we develop. So just some quick background um, on the toolkit, just to put this into context. The key objective of the toolkit was to develop guidebooks that mobilise the development of community energy projects, which reduce costs and timeline for delivery and the development of projects. And we've been told that you know, the, the guidebooks are already starting to help achieve these outcomes. So that's wonderful. But what else um, would we like to achieve? Develop more expertise in developing renewable energy, improve financial literacy and information on funding options, understanding the most workable community energy models, provide practical case studies, and most importantly, provide a financial template to assess the financial viability of the projects. And I'm very proud to say we're developing some amazing um, financial template champions all across Australia with the workshops that we have been running. So we're running workshops over the next few months, which will help people understand how to use the template so they can do their own financial assessment. And we encourage them to bring along real examples to the workshop so they can carry out a financial assessment actually at the workshop. And just to give you a heads up, the next ones that we've got um, in place, in, in planned, is Wagga Wagga on the 18th, Latrobe Valley on the 26th of this month, Perth 15th of November next month, and QBN on the 21st of November next month. So they're going to be all, all over Australia. So just to give you a bit of an overview of how the Behind the Meter Guidebook fits in with the rest of the toolkit. So the overall funding toolkit is set up on a modular basis and is comprised of a series of guidebooks. It, so there's one core funding guidebook, so this looks at the financing options for all the project-based guidebooks. So the core funding basics guidebook focuses on all different types of technologies, solar, um, wind, um, hydro, um, um, so it looks at all financing options. Now, what we've then developed is, or developing, are different modules based on the different technologies. So the first project model, module that we've developed is the Behind the Meter Solar PV project. Um, we're net looking to expand this further with solar PV storage um, next in line, and we're hoping to also do bioenergy and wind projects. As shown in the next slide, um, the toolkit consists of two guidebooks, the Funding Basic Guidebook, as we just mentioned, and this Behind the Meter Solar PV Guidebook. There's also a financial template in an Excel spreadsheet that enables the financial model to be developed. There's case studies that link each of the um, guidebooks together. And our focus today will be on the Behind the Meter guidebook. And we'll now drill into that a bit more. So this is a picture of what the Behind the Meter um, guidebook looks like. It's a very detailed document and really is a Bible for showing the steps of how to develop a behind the meter solar project. So let's just have an overview on what is included in the guidebook. So this is the index. So section A, this is the background and the structure of the toolkit and the rationale on why behind the meter solar and explaining what it is and why do the economics, why are the economics more likely to stack up. Section B um, explains the structure of the financial template that we provide and a description of the template and explains how um, to actually assess the projects financially. This also shows how to run sensitivity factors. Sensitivity factors looking at what variables can change and how can that actually have an impact. 
on um, the financial analysis. For example, um, you, you might have more than one scenario around solar because you might have an expected outcome, but you may want to have a look at how much um, variation there is to, to the solar generation to see how that might actually affect the um, financials. Section C of the guidebook goes through the key project elements in developing a behind the meter project. And in each of these project elements, it also references additional resources that can help you with each step. Um, this section is also linked to the funding guide. So it takes into account funding considerations when you look at some of the actual project um, elements. And then there's section D. So you can see this is very comprehensive and um, is a bit of a Bible. Um, so with um, section D, one of the important parts is the actual terminology. There is so much jargon in this sector. And if you're not from the energy market, um, it is really sometimes sounds like a very different language. So we've got a, a, a terminology section and also detailed case studies. And um, Mel will be taking us through some of these case studies um, very shortly. So let's go to the slide on what is behind the meter. So the next one, Mel. And um, behind the meter um, is really where the host site uses the electricity that is being produced rather than being exported into the network. The host building or site can be, it can be a building, it could be a factory or some other present um, premise. They're also grid connected um, integrated projects where there's a combination of electricity used at the site and a combination of electricity that goes to the grid. And they're also grid connected projects where there isn't any generation at the site and all the actual um, electricity is transported to the grid and usually sold to a third party. So let's look at why behind the meter. The benefit for behind the meter scenario is that you're competing with wholesale prices rather than retail prices to get a solar project funded. When you export to the network, you're selling at retail prices. That can be two to seven times the wholesale price. There are additional charges that you pay when you're selling retail that are not incurred when you sell directly at a wholesale rate to the site. Some of these charges include retailer energy charges, the retailer environmental charges, environmental charges are things such as re the renewable energy, various renewable energy certificates, and the various state-based energy efficiency schemes. Um, and there's retail market fees that you don't have to pay, and also certain network charges that are avoidable. So as these charges are avoided, the project is more viable, and the buyer should also get a competitive price. So everybody wins. So that's the outcome. And what we're seeing on behind the meter, the returns are actually, um, the payback is actually quite short, um, given that the energy prices are, are so high. So we see a lot of behind the meter projects um, happening um, um, you know, over, over the next year. Um, there already has been a lot. It's already the most popular type of community energy project, and mostly because it's where the where the economics really do stack up and the returns are there. Now moving to the next slide, um, and that covers the project area and focus. Um, with the behind the meter guidebook, we mentioned there are key project elements. So the way we designed it was into 15 project steps. So these are quite comprehensive, but these are all the elements that if you want to develop a project that you've got to consider. And each of these are discussed in a lot more detail. So I'll just give you a summary of what um, the key project elements are. So you can see this here, here the scope um, of what we cover. And what Mel will do is drill into the detail of some of these um, project elements. So there's the technology consideration. So a lot of aspects around quality concerns, um, warranties, insurances, all those things are considered in that component. The project scale, you know, what is optimal? Um, what is the right size? Um, these factors and parameters are provided. The importance of community engagement and, and, uh, how, and the considerations and how to go about it. Step four, your business or the legal structure of your business. What is the preferred structure? And, we cover a number of different structures um, and case studies of those structures in the guidebook. Project development, what is needed to be done and what resourcing is needed by the group so the group can understand 
what expert resources are actually needed. Number six, considerations for selecting a, slide, a, a site um, and how to acquire that site are all very important considerations. Resource assessment, which relates to the measurement of solar energy for the project. How do you go about measuring it? Um, how do you work out your sensitivities? Factors to consider for the construction of the site. Um, number nine, taking into account network connections and approvals. Network connections are a bit simpler for um, behind the meter, but still something that needs to be um, considered, particularly in certain circumstances. Number 10, what permits are needed and how to go about doing it. 11, ongoing operational resources to continue to operate the business. What is needed, the operational resourcing. Number 12, the project funding. You know, what are the options? And this is very much connected to the, the um, basic, base, basic funding guidebook that we discussed last week. Um, so the two connect and the, the other guidebook helps determine what is the best um, option. Um, step 13, agreement of power sales and the various options, power purchase agreement, leasing agreements, and various different options um, that can be considered on that end. And the importance of getting an agreement that is um, credit worthy um, and, and certain. Um, step 14, um, financial modelling requirements. And we got, as you know, a very big section on, on that and we'll be driving that a little bit further um, in the session. And number 15 is the risk management considerations. What are the risks? What are the risks that need to be considered um, in order to ensure that the project actually achieves its financial outcomes? So as you can see, the toolkit is extremely comprehensive. Um, for someone who um, has never um, developed a solar behind the meter project, this will provide um, a detailed step-by-step -step process of what needs to be considered. The feedback we've got from people who do have a good understanding of um, solar PV have still found it extremely useful because what we found is that not everyone is an expert on all components. Um, so we've had very good feedback on how it's helped people um, you know, be able to um, you know, overcome their gaps that they've got in how to develop a, a project and has, has, has enabled them to have a much better understanding in order to get a project developed, which has been really good feedback. So the next slide looks at the different project phases in the development of a project. Because there are different phases. Um, you don't want to be doing a detailed financial analysis at the start of the project because it may not be economic. So it's, um, it's looking at the step-by-step -step process. But what I'll do at this stage is I will pass you on to my colleague Mel and he will take you through the project phases in detail and drill down into the solar PV guidebook um, further. Over to you, Mel. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Just do a quick sound check. Tom, can you hear me? Okay, my microphone's been playing up. Okay, um, so just on the project phases, um, basically when we looked at the uh, funding toolkit and we looked at the analysis of various projects, we considered the various phases and what needs to be done at various phases. And um, when we talk about phases, we think of them as a concept phase where um, the idea is conceived and people have ideas. I'd like to do a you know, solar project. You know, what, what do you think we should do? You know, where should we put it, etc. The pre-feasibility phase goes further than that and, and the concept people decide they're going to go ahead and do it. They go and look at the pre-feasibility to work out you know, where should they should do it, where it makes sort of uh, some financial sense to do it, where they've got a host site that might be amenable and um, to, uh, having a, um, a solar PV on their, uh, on their uh, premises. And that's the pre-feasibility phase. So there you do some basic financial modelling and, and a number of other things. Feasibility phase is where you actually go and say the pre-feasibility looks good uh, and uh, or if the pre-feasibility doesn't look good, you probably need to go back and look at your concept or look at some of the, another site or something like that. If the pre-feasibility does look good, you go to a feasibility phase where you do more detailed uh, financial options, you anal analyse the modelling and you um, get a lot further down the track and you get to a stage where you get to a final funding where you've got everything in order, you've got all your, you know, your modelling done, you've done your financials and make sure that your investors or uh, your required returns from the project are able to be achieved. You've got um, details of firm quotes for construction, 
all that sort of stuff. So the final funding comes, you can go along and you can go to uh, investors or in the case of um, Behind the Meter, that's where most of the investment is through community um, investors. But um, you can go to whatever funding source you look, you're looking to utilise and you know that you've got all your uh, dots uh, lined up and all your T's crossed and everything's all, all sorted. And so you know that the project can proceed with a degree of certainty. So just um, with the financial modelling component of the guidebook, um, we're looking at um, uh, a, a model that allows you a template that allows you to put a series of inputs in and get a series of outputs. And a bit like anything, you know, model, garbage in, garbage out. So it's important uh, in, the, in the guidebook that we actually provide some guidance in terms of where you can source your information. So the guidebook's got certain information, but the template itself has got uh, a series of sheets which go through and explain some of the key inputs. If we just look at the, the financial modelling, it consists of seven or eight worksheets, uh, which is a cover sheet, a contents page, input assumptions, where you put all your inputs in, a host site benefits worksheet, which is important to work out what benefits the host site gets out of the, a project, one that looks at the investment return to see what you as a community energy group would get as an investment return from your project, um, a profit and loss worksheet, a balance sheet and a cash flow calculation sheet, all the accounting type things that you might need. And once again, this is a template. It's there to provide guidance. It's not a universal panacea. If you've got the right numbers here that everything will work out fine, you've got to be able to substantiate that numbers and also get uh, advice at certain times on things like you know, accounting advice, financial advice to confirm that everything that you've modelled here is, uh, is, is um, correct. So looking at a couple of the key templates, we've got the uh, investment return spreadsheet where you can see um, we do sensitivities. So scenarios one, two, three, four, and five. So you start off with a base case of your input assumptions, then you can vary various, various inputs by certain percentages and see what, how that will impact on your returns. So in this particular case, um, you can see that the um, return investor IRR post-tax on equity is 5%. And on the other scenarios that, that I've run here, you can see that they're getting higher returns because we've actually assumed you know, higher solar generation in the case of uh, scenario two. Uh, we can see it's got a whole sol higher solar generation for the same amount of capital output, uh, uh, capital cost, and therefore the returns are greater. Um, one of the things I've got here is the key metrics. The other thing I'd like to point out, we've put return on investment in here. Uh, that's something that people tend to understand. I'm, I'm not a big fan of return on investment um, because it can still show a positive number, but it doesn't actually calculate the, um, um, the, the return on capital. And what we do in the guidebook is explain why ROI is there, but why it's probably not the best indicator where something like internal rate of return or IRR is a, is a good, um, is a better proxy for um, the profitability or the returns on the project. And we go through and explain what each of the terms are on, on this sheet. So that's explained in the guidebook itself. Um, as I mentioned before, we've got a host site benefits worksheet, which goes through and now says, okay, up in the left-hand corner, you can see all what we've actually assumed for the host site what the size of the um, installation is, what price the host site's paying for electricity. And in this case, we've shown a lease arrangement and we've shown what the benefits would be if they, um, if they had an arrangement under, under this particular arrangement. And you can see on this particular arrangement, while the project's making good returns up here, 5%, 6%, 7%, the host site is actually not making any savings until year 10 when you hand the project over. So maybe you need to adjust some of the parameters to uh, make sure that the host site gets some benefits in the early years of the project. So that, that's part of the financial modelling. So I'm not going to go through in that much detail. In the workshops we run, we run into this for about three or four hours and go through um, a whole session on, on this and how to use the um, financial modelling. So uh, it takes a while to go through and go through the details. Um, but the inputs into that uh, are driven by some of the analysis that we do and we actually talk about some of these particular elements. So I'm just going to go through each of the project elements which in, each of them has some impact in terms of the input assumptions you put into the, into the actual financial model. So technology choice, the, the type of renewable energy project under consideration, well, you can say solar is solar, but solar isn't solar. Uh, there's a lot more options coming out um, in terms of things like you can have uh, solars with, uh, solar with uh, standalone inverters. You can have uh, solar with integrated micro-inverters in each panel now. So there's some technology um, differences you've got. The other thing you have in terms of your technology is you get things like quality, uh, warranties, um, all that sort of stuff and information that comes with the particular technology choice. You, you, when you buy, you, you get what you pay for in some cases. 
and in some cases you don't. So it's important to look at things like the warranty on the solar, uh, look at the installation, uh, make sure that it's um, that the, the type of solar and the, the actual installation that goes with it, um, that's sort of covered by a construction section a little bit later to a certain extent. But when you look at the overall warranty and the way the installation is going to be put together, you need to understand uh, what type of technology. If you've got an inverter with a warranty of five years, this is a world inverter with a warranty of 10 years, well then, you know, perhaps it's worthwhile paying the extra for the inverter with, with 10 years warranty, knowing that you won't have to replace it for 10 years, or if you do, the cost will be covered. Because uh, the cost of replacing an inverter after a period of time can be quite significant. You'll notice on the top, I've got uh, the project element and across the top of the, each heading, I've got concept slash pre-feasibility, feasibility and final funding. So concept slash pre-feasibility, when speaking to um, various uh, behind the meter um, community energy group proponents, project proponents, we, we noticed that they, they said, well, we don't really have a concept. We sort of do concept and pre-feasibility together. Um, it's not that big a project. It's not. Uh, we tend to sort of look at them at the same time and work together. So in this case, it was amalgamated concept slash pre-feasibility, and we looked at the feasibility and final funding. And for each project element, we provide a bit of a high-level guidance of what, where you should be at each stage of the um, project development phase. So concept pre-feasibility for PV, it'll mainly be a choice between solar cell and inverter manufacturers and the technologies used in each, and you should be able to get some budget quotes for each of those um, solar um, behind the meter options and should get a pretty good idea of what's uh, what it might cost. Um, you know, there's a number of solar providers and I'm sure they'll be happy to provide you a quote and uh, you can do your preliminary feasibility based on, based on that quote. Once you get to the stage where you think, well, this looks economic um, and I've got a project and a host site that looks like it's going to get some benefits and I'm also going to get a return from uh, my investment in providing that solar, I can then go and look at the feasibility stage. And I'll actually, from there, I'll actually start to get some detailed quotes on the solar technology and get some detailed quotes from at least from one or two. Uh, you may decide you just want to go with one and you, you've actually confirmed that the technology is good, it's proven, and that you're happy to go with it. And then once you go to final funding, you've got the firm prices available from the feasibility stage. You can actually go there knowing that you can buy um, that solar installation and have it installed for a particular cost. So your technology choice is covered uh, and you know that, that that's that's been covered off in your project um, uh, as a project element as part of the overall design and implementation. The next element is project scale. Um, this can be quite complex because there are a number of factors that come in here. One of the things I should say is these project elements can't be considered in isolation. A lot of elements impact other elements. Uh, and this is, this is one particular element where the scale uh, impacts a number of different elements. So the scale, by scale we mean the peak output, si output size of the project, how many kilowatts um, or megawatts, not many megawatt uh, size projects behind the meter, so I'll talk in terms of kilowatts. How many kilowatts um, peak capacity do I want to have from my project? And you may have a range that you may want to look at, and there's some issues with each of these. Uh, so for example, um, if you've got a project that's um, bigger than 100 kilowatts or more, not eligible to earn um, small te small technology certificates, and you have to, um, the only certificates you can create are large generation certificates, and I'll cut that off a little bit later when I get into the power sales side of things. But ostensibly, uh, you'll see a lot of uh, behind the meter projects that may be at 99 kilowatts, and you think, why did they stop at 99? The reason is they can get STCs, or small technology certificates, uh, deemed up front. By deeming, it means there's a calculation done, and uh, the, the project guidebook uh, uh, directs you to the um, uh, Clean Energy Regulators website where you can actually see that calculator. It actually deems how many certificates you'll get, um, uh, which is an estimate of how many certificates over the life of the project would be achieved uh, up until the year 2030 when the renewable energy target um, ceases. Um, so basically, if you try and put something in now, in uh, 2017, you've got um, 13 years or 14 years worth of uh, certificates that you can STCs. So it assumes this, the, there's a calculation done based on an average installation in the location you are, how many kilowatts, uh, kilowatt hours of generation would be produced. And for every um, 1,000 kilowatt hours or one megawatt hour, you're eligible to get an STC. So this calculator calculates how many STCs or how many megawatt hours of electricity you would produce between now and the end of 2030, and it deems that you'll create that many certificates. Those certificates have a financial value 
and that financial value uh, can be um, they, they can be sold, um, and quite often the solar installers will actually provide a capital price, uh, capital cost price, and they'll actually buy buy or give you a price if they keep the STCs. And those STCs typically have sat around thirty eight, thirty nine dollars for quite a period of time, uh, dropped down recently to twenty seven dollars. Um, so there is a, a variability in terms of what that what they might be. Um, so you need to determine at the time what that would be, but your solar installer can give you a quote on what the STCs would be. If you go above 100 kilowatts, instead of getting a significant number of deemed certificates up front, which you can reduce your capital cost by, you have to pay the full capital cost and have to sell large generation certificates every year. You can only create them yearly at the end of the year when you measure how many kilowatt hours of electricity you've got, how many Thousands of kilowatt hours get converted to megawatt hours. That tells you how many renewable or large LGCs you can get, and then you can sell them later on the market. Um, so a lot of projects that decide they have the, cap, the cost, the um, STCs up front, which reduces the capital costs. So that certainly is a, is a significant um, driver. One of the other drivers is uh, network um, connection, and I'll talk about that when I get to the network connection area. Um, from a feasibility, once that, so the concept free feasibility, you need to think, you know, am I first of all less than 100 or greater than 100? and then look at other factors. Um, and I'll talk about them when I come to the various elements like the size, things like roof area and things like that impact the project scale. So once the project scale is determined to a narrow bandwidth at feasibility stage, you've decided, okay, it looks like it's gonna be about 50 to 60. You get your quote, it's 55 kilowatts, for example. You've determined the project and then you can actually determine how much solar generation you may get. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to the section on resource assessment. So there's a number of factors that come into this, and uh, as they're not the only factors that come into the project scale. Um, the workshop covers this in a little bit more detail, but in the time we've got in one hour, we've still got another 14 elements to cover, so I better keep moving forward. Community engagement. Um, I probably don't need to tell um, community energy groups uh, the importance of community engagement. They can probably tell me uh, how important it is and how, how they go about it, but it's very important that you do engage with the community. Um, and that's the same whether it's a community energy project or even a, a large commercial project, for example, a large wind project or a large solar farm. They, those projects need to engage with the community. The community engagement in this case is um, probably a little bit more uh, detailed in the sense that the community uh, will obviously engage. That gives you more people who are interested and will participate in your community energy group. The more people that will um, be supportive of your projects. And uh, the more opportunity you may have to um, get investors from the community, community investors who are keen to put some money into the project to help provide the final funding. And uh, this section talks about some of those aspects. I should highlight of what I've given here is, is the high level view. In the, in the guidebook, it goes through, uh, has about two or three pages on at least each of these, um, each of these project elements. So yeah, there's much more detail there. The type of business, uh, or legal slash financial structure used to develop and operate the project. Um, so basically, um, we've seen a few few of the case studies that we've had, two of the two case studies we have, and, and in some other issues. Groups start off with a particular business structure to actually get the concept up, get the pre-feasibility done. And then later on, they decide to have a different business structure for actually running the, the business projects. Once again, I'll cover that a little bit later, but it's important that you have a business structure in place. That business, and part of that business structure is also a project governance structure. So once you start, you know, get to a concept pre-feasibility and you start bringing money in to a project, you need to be accountable. And so you need to have a business structure that uh, is, is accountable and is a legal entity that is responsible for uh, taking that money, whether it's donations, grants, um, um, investors, investment funds, loans, you certainly need to have a structure in place. We covered that off on the previous case study. We went through the business structures in a little bit of detail and uh, some of the previous um, webinars have gone into the business structure side of things as well. So I'm not gonna to cover too much more at this point in time, other than to say that the guidebook's got a fair bit of information on that particular aspect. Um, project development resourcing. Okay, you have gotta develop the project. The thing you need to consider is what do I need to go from my concept to final funding and how much money or what resources I need to get me from that concept pre-feasibility stage through feasibility to final funding. So the first thing you need to do is look at your community group and see what skills you've got in that group, what you you, you need and, and what, what particular skills you've got. So you need to identify the skills you require. So whether there's accounting skills, legal skills, te technology skills in terms of, you know, you might have, a, you'd be lucky enough to have a solar designer that you can access to who can help you out on the, on the way through. But if you can identify those skills, 
you then need to work out what skills, what skill gaps there are. And this guidebook gives you an idea of what skills you actually need, what things you need to do, what project elements you need to cover, and will give you an idea of what gaps there are in what your skill base is and what you may need to do to actually acquire those skills. So you may be able to acquire those skills through getting co-opting them on as a volunteer into your community energy group. You may be able to get um, uh, some pro bono work done. You may be able to get lower cost um, uh, services. Or you may be able to, um, but the most important thing is to identify what costs are going to be incurred so that when you actually go through project development, you work out what sort of budget I'm going to need to get me from concept pre-feasibility to feasibility and then from feasibility to final funding. Then have a plan to get your funding to get from um, the concept pre-feasibility through to final funding. It's very important that you do that because um, without funding, obviously a project doesn't get developed. Um, Site selection and acquisition, uh, the main thing is to get a, for a behind the meter, is to get a good host site. And that's one of the biggest challenges I think a lot of projects are having at the moment, finding a host site that is amenable to having solar PV on their roof and one that is also going to get a benefit um, by um, having a, being sold electricity for behind the meter at a rate at which the community energy group can make money as well. So it's, we want to get a host site that's got a reasonably high electricity price and a, um, that will actually give a good return for the uh, community energy group and also good savings for that host site. And obviously the financial model I showed you before has got a template that shows the host site benefits and it also shows the returns for the community energy group in terms of any investment in the project. So at the initial stage, concept feasibility should have a broad host site selection criteria, be that geographic, be that size, be that uh, specific industry or uh, whatever it happens to be. Um, then you may narrow that down to one or two host sites. You go and speak to them and get more, uh, engage them and hopefully get uh, a positive response. Then you can do your financial modeling based on them, show them the benefits to them, uh, work out the benefits to yourself uh, of using that site and then go to final funding. There's a whole section on site selection and acquisition and the things that you should look at. Things like uh, making sure that it's got a good solid roof that you're not going to have to um, reinforce because if you have to reinforce the roof there probably goes your project viability. Um, you have to look at it whether it's a heritage site and whether you can overcome heritage issues. Uh, a whole range of different issues that you need to consider there. And obviously the roof area needs to have a reasonable size roof area, at least large enough to cover the, um, the scale that you're contemplating for your project. As I said before, a lot of these project elements inter interact. So in this case, your site selection, you need to have a roof big enough to accommodate the scale. So either that you, check to, you select a new site or you, put, uh, you find a, um, you reduce your scale to fit on that this particular site. Resource assessment. So the resource we're talking about here in the case of uh, behind the meter solar is purely solar. So you'll find that um, depending on where you are, there is more, more solar radiation the for, further north you go generally in Australia. So you'll find that, um, and uh, to a certain extent, the further west you go as well. So it really just depends on um, where you are and where you're located as to um, how much uh, solar radiation is available. Then you actually go to look at roof orientation, roof uh, tilt, a, number, a whole range of different factors that will determine uh, what's your potential solar output from that project. Now in the guidebook refers you to a number of different solar calculators that you can use. Um, we use the Sunulator in our, uh, as an example in some of, some of our, um, our workshops. But you can use the guidebook um, provides a number of different solar calculators that are out there that you can actually make an, at least an initial calculation on um, on the, how much solar you might be able to get. And it's not quite as simple as just putting the numbers in because there's a lot of site specific issues and things that people don't consider. Things like um, you know, is there any trees that are going to put shade shade on the uh, solar panels? And uh, one of the ones that came up in the workshop the other day was you know, is there a lot you know, the big building being built next to you which will actually reduce the shading? Uh, sorry, increase the shading and reduce the solar output. So a number of those things need to be factored in. And when you get to the final feasibility stage, so pre-feasibility, you can use those calculators to give you a bit of a rough idea of you know whether the thing might be viable or not. But before you go to final funding, you should get a, um, a, a solar designer um, to actually come in and, and, and uh, do a, uh, an analysis. And uh, by a solar designer, it may be just a solar um, installer who will provide that uh, solar design and um, those solar calculations uh, free of charge as part of the quote. But it's important that you actually uh, factor that in uh, as it can have a significant variance if you've forgotten one or two factors. 
Um, the next one looks at construction um, and those constructions, a uh, project element looks at determining the costs of, to obtain the equipment, install it and commission the project to operational phase. That's once you've got your solar installation and part of your quote normally when you go to feasibility is to construct and install. So you, they supply um, and install the equipment and construct it. But it's very important that you factor the construction costs in as I mentioned before, you don't want to have to go and reinforce the roof or, or do other things uh, that are required to add to your costs. So um, construction is a very important part of that. If I just go to network connections, um, once again, this is a fairly significant one, um, and uh, a few people have come come a um, come across hurdles in this particular area. Generally, um, some of the scale issues that people encounter are related to network connections. And it's very dependent on what your network um, operator, um, in network uh, local network um, operator um, rules are, and what their arrangements are. And you should you should be able to get familiar, and you should be able to get the information from that um, company's website normally. But there's some certain things that come in. For example, a lot of um, suppliers will, for example, say if you're less than 30 kilowatts, you'll you can get connection uh, by just paying a, a certain fee. If you go above 30 kilowatts you may have to pay um, a figure of several thousand dollars to get a, ne a network study done. And if you go even larger again, you may have to pay up to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars to get a network study done. So when you're actually looking at sites, it's very important to liaise closely with the local network operator and, and, and hopefully uh, get a good working relationship with them. And they'll might be able to give you an idea of you know where are good places to uh, connect solar and, and where aren't good good places to connect solar. Um, it's not necessarily the network operators are being um, hard to get along with. There are technical reasons why certain scale and in certain locations just do not work. If you're on the end of a long skinny network line, you know, 50 kilometers away from the nearest substation, probably not the best place to put 100 kilowatts worth of solar. Um, but once again, if work closely with your local network operator, because this can be make or break. I've heard of examples. Uh, recently, in our workshops, of people who want to put 30, uh, 40, 50 kilowatts in, and up for 50 grand, $50,000 worth of uh, network analysis load studies that have to be done. Uh, if that's the case, I suggest you get another site because that $50,000 is going to be more than the capital cost, or as much as the capital cost of your solar PV. So you're done, going to double your capital cost. So it's very important to, to factor in network connections. Permitting. Um, the important thing with permitting is to make sure you obtain all necessary regulatory licensing and permits. In general, <coughs> a small scale solar PV, a lot of, lot of um, councils have a certain size as a complying development. You don't need to put in a development application. Um, the solar installer can put in a um, building application and that can be installed as part of the overall process. So you're not up for a lot of dollars for doing things like um, getting a development approval, etc. For a larger installation, you may have to get development approval or there, there may be heritage environmental um, and, and other costs um, incurred. If you've got a heritage building, you may have to actually go and get heritage approvals or get changes or, or adapt your installation to um, get approval to install on a uh, heritage listed site. Um, once again, solar providers can usually help you with uh, where there's, there's going to be uh, potential issues, but certainly make sure you've got a reputable supplier um, who, who is actually honest and will actually guide you through this process. Um, the other thing with permitting, in some cases if you're selling electricity and depending on the state, there's different rules. If you're selling electricity from your installation to a, um, a host site, you're selling electricity and you need a license to do that. And if you don't have the license, you need to get an exemption. So some states don't require exemptions for certain sizes. Some states do require you to go and get a, an exemption. Uh, it's an approval process. It doesn't necessarily cost you anything, but you need to go through the process. Just something to be aware of. Looking at operational resourcing, we've also come across examples um, of people, uh, of projects that uh, have looked at their viability and looked at how they're going to do, all the economics look really good until they actually start to work out how much it's going to cost them to operate their business structure. For example, if you've got a business structure that's a, um, a company and you have to have a, get an audit and you have to um, uh, satisfy other requirements for uh, associated with your investors, maintain a share registry, um, send out bills, maintain the equipment, a whole range of costs come into play. And we know things like and director's insurance, if you've got a company, all those insurances, those audit costs can actually um, become significant, especially if you've got a, like a five, 10 kilowatt project, 
those costs can swamp that swamp the um, benefits from those those size projects. So when you're looking at scale and you're looking at your operational resourcing, you need to make sure your scale is sufficient to create a cash flow that is able to cover these operational resources and at the same time still um, allow you to um, return a profit to your investors. The model lists a whole lot of different operational uh, factors that you may want to consider and um, that you may want to include in the um, uh, in the um, in your modeling. So there's a whole lot of prompts in the Excel um, template that it will actually give you an idea of things. Have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? You put zero dollars against them, but they're actually flagged against there so the people are aware. Uh, give them some guidance. Have you thought about this particular aspect? So your operational resourcing you need to be very careful of. Um, if you're doing ma want maintenance to occur, um, then you need to make sure you've got a contract for maintenance and you may want to um, do that through your solar provider in the first place, but you need to make sure you maintain the solar installation. And it may be simple as just cleaning and uh, people have actually told me you can get up to 5% or even up to 8% if it's very dirty, you haven't cleaned your uh, solar installation. Um, in, in areas particularly where uh, the, the tilt angle isn't particularly high and in an industrial area. So once again, you need to basically, as part of your final funding, to make sure you've actually factored those costs in and are able to demonstrate that you've got those costs covered in your financial modelling. Project funding. Okay, that's what our, we, our webinar was about last week, trying to get the project funding. We talked about the project development resourcing as one of the previous elements. Those project element resources give you a bit of an idea of um, as to what um, your, what sort of funds you're going to need to get your project from concept slash pre-feasibility through to feasibility, and then from feasibility through to final funding. So you need to consider what funding sources are available. I won't go over what we start um, uh, what we spoke about um, last week, but basically you've got all your, all your different funding options from concept pre-feasibility through to final funding and uh, you can refer to last week's webinar if you want to go through those particular uh, examples again, or you can read the guidebook where we go through that in a lot more detail. Power sales. Um, power sales side of thing is where you get your revenue. Um, you're producing uh, electricity from your solar installation and you need to sell it to someone. And behind the meter, you're selling it to a host site. And uh, as we spoke about before, it's important that the price you sell to gives the host site a benefit, as well as giving you sufficient revenue to cover, um, to repay your capital, to uh, give a return on your capital, but also to cover your operational costs and um, make sure that the project's viable, uh, both from inception and ongoing. So you need to actually do a bit of an analysis on the host site and work out what their costs are, so you can actually work out what the uh, whether it's a win-win. The, um, the financial template goes through and tells you the sort of factors you need to put in to determine the host site electricity costs and allows you to model that and uh, provide a, a graph showing the, um, the benefits the host site could get. Uh, one of the things in terms of power sales is you also got to consider what sort of power sales form you want. Do you want a power purchase agreement where you're selling electricity at cents per kilowatt hour race, our rate? Do you want to use a lease model where you sell electricity to the host site under a lease where they pay a fixed amount a month? Or do you want to loan the money to the host site and they pay you back principal and interest over a period of time? All those things have different benefits and uh, different um, pros and cons, and uh, the guidebook goes through those particular things and talks about those, those elements. Once again, time is in this webinar, it's not enough time to go through those particular elements, but I think it's uh, very important that uh, being the, the thing that makes a project viable or not, that you give significant consideration into what your source of revenue will be. Financial modelling. Um, Looking at uh, the role of financial modelling, I've covered that in quite a bit of detail, so I'm not going to cover that more here. But basically, we've got the financial model template. You should use it to work out whether your project's feasible or looks like it's, uh, it's going to be feasible at the pre-feasibility stage. If it's not, go and look at another project. Don't waste your time. Let's just do a quick analysis, and if it looks like it's close or it might be viable, yes, look at it further. If it's not, look like it's nowhere near it, then I suggest you re, re, um, reassess your project. Look at a new host site, look at a different scale, look at a different location. Etc. So it's very important that the financial modelling can stop you wasting a lot of time going down different rabbit holes that are going to lead you to nowhere. Risk management, there's a, um, obviously that's a key thing. You need to manage all the risks. And what we've provided in the guidebook is a, a risk check checklist. It's not a um, particularly uh, exhaustive checklist, but it's a list of checklists that goes through each of the project elements. And just given the time constraints, I'm not going to go through each of them but it looks at each project element and looks at factors you should consider. 
have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you got this covered? Goes through each of the elements, as I said, and looks at that particular element and looks at does that element cover off this aspect? Does it cover off at that aspect? Does it cover off this aspect? Once again, all through all the elements, it goes through and provides a checklist of things. As it, once again, you should, there, this does not mean that you've covered off this, that you've covered all risks, but it means that you've covered off a lot of the, the ones that people have commonly come across. The next section of the model is looking at, uh, of the guidebook looks at case studies, and I'm just going to cover these very quickly, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, case study one is the Repower, Shoalhaven Repower One project, uh, which has been operating for a few years now, and case study two is the Young Henry's project, which is operating operating for nearly a year now, I think. Um, so they're, they're two projects, both behind the meter solar, and the case studies in the guidebook um, cover each of these. Repower Shoalhaven One was one which was implemented quite quickly from the original concept in February 2014 to being installed in uh, August 2014. So six months from the concept, it was actually installed. Now the structure of that is and how it was funded, um, basically the, um, the project itself was a, um, a proprietary limited company. So the Repower Shoalhaven original model was to have a proprietary limited company with each solar project and that each and part of that um, each project was run under the um, uh, overall actors of the Repower Shoalhaven Inc. So the Repower Shoalhaven is an incorporated association and under its um, banner uh, it has a services agreement with each of the proprietary limited com uh, companies. There's a PPA between uh, Shoalhaven Bowling Club, uh, the host site and the proprietary limited company and dividends go to community investors who invest on the basis of shareholder agreements. And uh, the design and construct and operation and maintenance contract was done with a solar installer. Um, the pie chart on the left provides a breakup of where the money came from to fund the project. Uh, once again, a significant amount of that was some in-kind contributions. Uh, about 20% came from um, the Shoalhaven Bowling Club um, providing a, um, an investment. And uh, another 120,000 came from community investors with um, a certain amount of, other amount of money came from grants and donations. Case study two was a Pingala Young Henry's project was a little bit different uh, for the reasons set out here. Basically, instead of having a um, proprietary limited company, um, the Pingala Association uh, set up all their projects under a cooperative. That meant uh, the cooperative structure meant they could have a large number of uh, members who could effectively become um, uh, owners of the of the projects and the cooperative could run multiple projects under the one banner. So that has a certain number of advantages which we spoke about in terms of business structure advantages and which we cover further in the guidebook. Um, at this point in time, that's as much as I want to go through at this point. I'm just conscious of the time and allowing some time for questions. So um, Tom, I'll hand over to you to, if you want to sort of um, see if there's any questions arising out of the uh, presentation. Well, yeah, thanks Mal. Thanks Jennifer. Um, we haven't actually got any questions in yet. Um, so uh, can I ask you a question? Well, it's not as a non-question, but are, are there any particular uh, recurring themes that come to you when you do do the training and do these presentations? What sort of questions do you think people commonly have? Mm, that's a really tough question actually, Tom. <laughs> Um, Mel, I think it's the financing side, um, you know, what are the um, preferred structures, the financing, um, and also um, we do a lot of detail around the inputting into the financial model um, and where the actual inputs come from. Um, we get a lot of questions around that and also how to read the different um, outputs. Um, so. I think that's a really large part of where we actually spend our time, Mel. Mel? Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely the case. The, fin the, the financial modelling is the, in the end is where people struggle. But the good thing about doing the financial template is that actually makes them think about things that they may not have thought about before. Um, so in sense that we've got these 15 project elements, or 15 project elements that we've listed here, um, a lot of the inputs rely on those elements having been thought about. And so it provides a prompter for them. So I think, um, but people do get recurring things like, should I go a lease? Should I go a, um, 
um, a loan, should I go a PPA? And the answer is it depends. They've got pros and cons of each and depends what your hours, what sort of business structure should I use? It depends on what your goals and what your um, attributes, uh, what your aspirations are. And that's why the case studies, are, and there's two case studies we've got, have been quite good because they're quite different in their structures and they provide different values and different objectives of um, that, that were looked look at being achieved. So, yeah, I don't think, they're, they're, I think the common theme is, yes, we're not exactly sure what to do. Because that's a recurring yeah. thing, so how do we go about it? And uh, yeah. there is no universal answer, but there's a whole series of things that, that in this guidebook that will help you. Sure. And Mel, one thing um, is the early stage um, funding, which is always a challenge. You know, community groups get together, but you know, how do they go about um, getting the funding? Um, and that is the most difficult part, I think. Um, we've been very fortunate in Australia that there has been the ability to access grants and a really good network across the community renewable energy network where people, you know, are aware of the grants that, that are around. Um, but new models, I think, um, that people are looking at is community groups actually do invest a lot of time into projects um, and put a lot of sweat equity in there. And quite often they, they don't expect any return. Um, but, you know, I think that might change going forward where, you know, community groups can look to actually get some value um, for the time that they actually put into projects. Um, so um, I think that is more a more sustainable model going going forward. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so quest another question I have, and there's no other questions coming through, so we might be wrapping this up pretty soon, um, is Obviously, the toolkit is comprised of these documents as well as the Excel spreadsheet. How, what is what? It, just to be very clear about this, what is the scope of that that financial calculator that is the Excel spreadsheet? What what, it, what is it intended to be? What is it not intended to be? And how much can it be used by any group as their as their main it, form of calculating the the outcomes of their projects? Yeah. I'll let you answer that one, Mel. Do you want to cut? Yeah, that's okay. fine. I'll happy to answer. Yeah, the, the the template is not is not a silver bullet, and we actually write that in. There's a there's a section in the in the first thing. Um, one of the other extra sheets I've added in recently that goes and says it's not a silver bullet. Just because you put some numbers in and you get a positive numbers out doesn't mean your project's going to succeed. What it does is it provides a, a guide, and you need to get the model reviewed. It's not it's not a it's a it's really a pre what well, I suggest is a pre feasibility. Uh, slash feasibility model that lets you stops you going down rabbit holes and allows you to fine tune your project to get it near viability. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if you you should get it uh, independently reviewed well, by uh, uh, someone with some financial uh, um, capability and mm -hmm. make sure that the numbers stack up. It, it covers a number of different business structures. It includes a number of depreciation models. Mm -hmm. It includes a number of taxation models. But you know those those there are structures that won't be covered by the template. Um, and we haven't tried to be all things to all people. We've tried to be most things to most people. So um, that's the approach we've taken. It is a template. It is a model. It's not a uh, magic recipe um, to, to success. Okay. Uh, so you need so, to make it sure that it, the app is ordered. Yeah, so one of the other tools that's out there is um, ATA, Alternative Technology Association Sunulator, which allows, gr which allows groups to... Um, enter parameters about the size of the solar system, the location of it, the energy retail tariff, electricity retail tariffs, um, and then it provides a bunch of outputs around the likely um, value of the electricity generated over time and make some assumptions uh, about what that would look like into the future as well, all based on inputs. And it sounds like that would be a very similar um, like a pre-feasibility or early stage way of modeling, um, you're still going to need to have the solar, solar company do their very detailed solar design and the, the output based on that. And then that needs to be married up with the, the financial model. So it looks like it would sit next to something like an ATA simulator. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, that's correct. That we actually use the ATA simulator in our workshops, but we use it more to understanding the amount of export that will go into the grid. Um, ATA have done a, a really incredible job in dealing with, because you're dealing with a lot of data 
um, and they've done a great job and invested a lot into coming up with those um, and, and it's a very important number I suppose to get right um, and it's a very difficult calculation if you're not used to dealing with um, a lot of numbers in the electricity market. So what we do during the workshop is actually go through how to use that part of the simulator. Um, in terms of the financial model um, itself, um, um, uh, our model is more focused around doing the financials, um, um, I suppose, typical to what any, you know, an investment bank would want to see. Um, the simulator, um, you can't see the transparency behind the numbers. It's more, it is more of a black box. Still a really good tool. That's why we do use it as part of our um, process. But what we have is something that, you know, if you're seeking investment, it's a lot more transparent and probably is a bit more comprehensive as a um, financial template. Mel, given that you created the financial template, I'll, I'll let, let you have a comment too. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think yeah, the Sunny Later is a great tool and it, it's, it's got a number of features and Sunny Later, you, you've actually spoken to us um, uh, about, about doing something potentially in the future, just informally. Um, but I think uh, we, we've got a lot more features like depreciation, taxation, different models, different uh, franking credits, um, management of, of those types of things and how those structures work, a lot more sort of, uh, of the more detailed financial aspects. Uh, certainly there's good for pre-feasibility and, and high level financial analysis. Uh, ours is a little bit more targeted. We've got scenario sensitivity scenarios in ours. Um, so effectively it is, um, it's just, it's just a, a, an additional level of um, detail uh, in ours, in the financial model, uh, but the simulator model is, is very good uh, as an initial um, um, cast, casting item to, to look at. But certainly things like operational resourcing and the cost of running your business, which can kill projects uh, if you don't have those covered, uh, may not be flagged. The, the, the template we've got actually flags those things and say, yeah, have you put a number against this? And say, oh, I hadn't thought of that. So you put a number against it. So. That's, that's one of the, the bigger differences. Uh, the rest of it, uh, we provide you know, a full set of financial statements and things like that. Just a little bit more comprehensive and uh, we're covering a, a few more scenarios than what the sunlight would. Yeah, sure. Another um, advantage with the um, template um, we found is um, just people understanding the numbers and how the financial model is made up and, the, and understanding the paybacks and the returns. When they do get quotes from solar panel providers, they know the things to look for and the, and the questions to ask. Um, and there's a lot of value there because what um, Mel and I found, um, you know, we, we've looked at procurement processes before and the range of assumptions um, that range when you get quotes in from solar panel um, providers is actually significant. Um, and initially, you know, we've looked at tenders where, where, you know, the one that looked like they were the cheapest and the most effective, when you actually drilled into the numbers, they, they, they weren't actually anywhere even up there. So being able to understand the assumptions and what they might look like. And when we go through the financial template, you know, we, we look at losses, we look at a whole lot of other things and what you should expect to see with those numbers. Um, so it makes, um, the, you know, knowing how to use the template um, does give a much more greater governance process and, and is a greater due diligence process than would, would otherwise be applied and is more likely to get a, get a better outcome. Okay, that's great. Uh, we probably should wrap this up. What, uh, where are you up to with your training? Is that, are those training dates now on your on your website? And and where can people find out? Yeah, there? um, they 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 should be. I was just I just got a text message from a marketing person saying that um they should be up there. Um, and as mentioned, um, we've already got a few planned for this year. Next year, we've got Cairns and um, Brisbane, so Queensland will be more next year. Um, we are planning to do one in South Australia this year as well um, and also Tasmania next year. So, um, yeah, but they're going really well. We've only done two so far, but the feedback has been very positive. Um, but um, we, we expect, um, you know, the um, workshops to continue to be really positive. One thing we're doing um, and adding to because of the feedback from our workshops is we're doing a case study, which is a step-by-step -step process on how to use a financial template. Um, a very typical example, we, we're doing a primary school 
something that is familiar to everyone and it'll be step by step and we'll also do a step by step how to use the simulator, um, ATA simulator to get that export data as well, just to make it even more simpler um, for um, people who want to run, run through it um, and have an example that can look at as they develop their own project. Right, so we now uh, we now have a growing body of open source tools that allow our community yes. to do yes. their own source. The only problem when we go to these workshops, Tom, we, we get more work to do because <laughs> <laughs> the community groups have so many good ideas and um, and um, they're all so lovely that when I ask us to do things, um, we always like to help out. <laughs> So, um, but you know, it's it's just it's been an enjoy such an enjoyable journey working with um, community groups, and we're just loving seeing them being so successful. Okay, well, thank you both. Thank um, you. Really appreciated hearing more about the toolkit and your time. So, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Um, as always, we've been recording this webinar, and will be published on our website um, in the morning. Um, and I'll send out a, 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 an email asking for some feedback. So, so please get onto that quickly. Thank you for being um, good host, Tom, week. again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, catch up. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for all your efforts putting this together. Thanks. Thank you.